some of the mistakes you make early on in a company, you can never recover from. So you've you got to make sure that you go into it with your eyes open and with a full-fledged plan of execution. And we are here. Peter Taunton is in the building. What's up, Peter? Hey, my man. It's so good to be here. I've been looking forward for this uh, interview for a long time, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of this. Let's do it. Man, if you're looking forward to this, then I'm freaking super looking forward to this. I enjoyed our initial conversation so much. I mean, the amount of value I got from a 25-minute phone call with you just blew my mind. The fact that we get to double that up today, all the listeners are in for a treat. Oh, that's very kind of you to say. I'm looking forward to it. As we discussed earlier, n nothing's off the table, right? So you go ahead and ask me anything you'd like. I'll give it to you raw and real. Raw and real, baby. That's that's yeah. that's the nature. Yeah. So, I mean, dude, you've had such a, a wealth of experiences. You know, uh -huh. you've gone through the gauntlet. You've gone through the business gauntlet. You've gone through the hardships, the struggles, the starting from the bottom. Now we hear the whole deal. And now you've really kind of arrived to, you know, what most people can only dream of, you know, a success level, uh, whether that be financially, spiritually, uh, that, you know, most people just think every day they want to get. And you got there and it's very rare to find people that number one, get there, but then number two, to figure out what they're doing from there. And, you know, everything you do, it seems like it's geared towards philanthropy, helping people, sharing with the world. And that's a gift. I mean, that's that just says so much about who you are. So first of all, I appreciate that you exist. <laughs> Thanks, man. And uh, I would love to know, like, let, let's kind of start it off. I think this whole dream with some of your brands and all this, it all started with racquetball, I believe. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I'll even take you back further. You have been, there's so much of what I learned in my life. And in fact, I was just doing an interview this morning and I said, I never thought that at eight years old, selling popcorn for my father in front of his little grocery store, that it was going to have such a profound effect on, on how I live my life today. And, and what I mean by that, I, I had a front row seat to watching my dad, who owned this, this little red owl store in Wilmer, Minnesota. And, uh, and him being the owner, nothing was off the table. And, and I really appreciated that about my father. You know what? You would see him shoveling the sidewalk. You would see him bagging groceries. You would see him working the till. You would see him balancing the books, stocking the shelves. Nothing was off the table for him, which I love. Secondly is he felt like he was, every, he was just part of the team. And I always say business is a team sport. And my dad realized that. So when I'm watching him through the lens of an eight-year-old, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sophisticated enough to think about how I would utilize those things. But as I built companies along the way, uh, you know, I, I always tried to aspire to be like my father, meaning that it was that I would jump right in the trenches with my employees. I never, I, I was never uh, condescending. I would never ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And I treated everyone with respect and, 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 and dignity. And when you do that, People just want to fall in line and want to work with you, you know, not for you, but work with you. In fact, even when I see former employees today, I don't say I was their boss. I said we had the opportunity to work together. Right. And that just happened just just a, you know, a week ago during the Super Bowl. One of my former employees was with me and that's how I introduced her. I said we had the opportunity to work together. Now she says, hey, that's bullshit. We actually I worked for him, you know, but. It, it, it's that's just how I roll because it's, mm. it's it's a team sport we all work together well you've seen what works and what doesn't work throughout all the years too and I'm sure that when you first got involved it wasn't exactly that refined but you know throughout the years you've seemed to really master the communication aspect of running large organizations I you know and I've had to I've been blessed with with putting good people around me. And I always felt like I was a little bit of a casting director, right? That you cast people in certain roles. In fact, with, the, with each of the, of the department heads that I had, I let, them, I let them hire and fire their own people, okay? Because when they would, when they would wanna let someone go, and I think that this is an important lesson, some of my leaders, some of my directors, they thought long and hard about terminating somebody because at some point in time, they saw value in that person when they hired them. So that when they come and they say, Peter, I'm letting so-and-so go. My first question to them is always, 
what happened in the two years that they worked underneath you that you saw something brilliant in them two years ago and now you've lost that. So did we fail them or did they fail us? Let's get to the bottom of it. And it's very, it's very important because sometimes, you know, leadership loses sight of, of the direction of the company or how to lead the people. So uh, I think it's a valid point to just make sure you got everybody pulling deep on the oars and more importantly, in the same direction. Right. I love the or reference. Everyone grab an or and let's freaking go. Let's go. You got it. Right. So at what point, so you're, you're selling popcorn, you've always had this entrepreneurial drive, but you know, you really had your break came as sort of based on the story you mentioned, you kind of had an opportunity just to give some value to somebody. And then yeah. years later, that person you gave value to ends up calling you up to make you the manager of their whole gig. And yeah. that turns into a whole you know, snowball effect, which led to an empire. Can you kind of yeah. give us the story behind that? Yeah, for sure. I, um, so I, when I was, when I was younger, I started playing racquetball of all things. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, I would spend most of my time in this court, uh, in this club playing racquetball. So I would spend literally four to six hours a day, no joke. Cause when you're going to try to play racquetball and play anything at a high level, you got to put in your time. Right. So I was there and I, and I saw how the manager was running the gym. Make a long story short, I was getting ready to move to Orlando, Florida. I had breakfast with the owners the morning that I was moving. And I said, look, guys, I just want to tell you something. Guys, I feel like I owe this to you. You guys are never, and, and the club was losing money, by the way. It was losing like $200,000 a year of cash flow. There was five owners. So every year, everybody's throwing in 40 grand, right? So after, after a steady diet of that for several years, these guys were tired. So I told them, guys, you're not going to like what I have to say, but the guy you have running your gym, he's not your answer. He's never going to get you to the promised land, right? And I told him, he just he doesn't engage the members. He doesn't engage the community. Uh, and, and those are two things you're going to need to do in whoever you, you hire. Now, peace out. I'm heading to Orlando. And I said, but if you ever want to turn this club around, give me a call. Well, I'll be damned. Careful what you wish for, right? About a year later, they call me, a year and a half later. And they say, look, we'd like you to come back and run our club. And uh, we're going to pay you $16,000 $16, a year, which is has got to be poverty, right? You got it's got to damn near be poverty. So 16,000 a year, but they said, Hey, Peter, if you can turn this club around for us, we'll let you have, we'll let you buy us out with the profits that you generate. Well, that's all I needed, right? I just needed that. I just needed the opportunity. I had nothing going, you know, racquetball was fun. I got to travel around the country, but you can't make a living at it, a real living, right? So this, this was my big window. This was my opportunity. And there was no plan B for me. It was, look, I'm going to make this thing go. And, and uh, God willing, I was. I was never afraid of hard work going back to the eight-year-old popcorn guy, right? Seeing my dad get up at dark and, and come home at dark. So I, I, I got to witness what, a, what, a, what an honest full day of work looked and felt like. I rolled up my sleeves and got after it. And uh, make a long story short, it took me about eight years, seven years to buy out the partners or get to a point where I had 51% equity. And then I went and refinanced everything. So I had a little breathing room. And I did that for 20 years. I, I took one club and leveraged another. And, and uh, I was never afraid of debt because when you start with nothing, you're fearless. You know what the bottom feels like because you live there, right? So um, I, I would love her as soon as I'd have half my debt paid off, I'd go right to back to the bank. I'd get another loan. I'd build another club. Anyway, I did that for 20 years. So let, yeah. let me just circle back because there's a lot of juice in between there. So you, you get this opportunity to run this club and they make an agreement with you where based on how much profits you make, you can then buy out a certain piece of equity per club. Or how yeah. did that whole agreement only work? One. Yeah, there was only one club in one club and the club, keep in mind, was losing 200 grand a year. OK, so these guys had been feeding this thing. So they said, hey, look, they probably they didn't put a ceiling on how much equity I could acquire. OK, because to be honest with you, they probably thought it was a Hail Mary. Right. What did they have to lose? So they bring this guy up from from Orlando, Florida, rocking the mullet. And they, what, what, what's he going to do? Right. So. They tell you what, you know, what they underestimated was I had the heart of a lion, right? And, and, and I remember I said, hey, what's my marketing budget, right? I'm like 22 years old now, right? I said, what's my marketing budget? They looked at me like I had a horn growing out of my head. And they said, marketing budget? Maybe you didn't hear us. We lost 200 grand this year. We have no marketing budget. So I started bartering. I got creative, you know. In, that, in those moments, those character building moments, 
you're either going to crawl under your desk in the fetal position or you're going to spit in your palms and go get it. So I went in that community and I went, I remember I went into the Florida ceiling store, which was a carpet store. And I said, look, I need carpet and I don't have any money, but I have memberships. And I'll be damned if they didn't say, okay, well, you know, we'll trade with you. Well, I did that with every carpet store. I did it with carpet. I did it with painters. I did it with electricians. And, and when I started remodeling the club, I started in the lobby, like when you come in, because that was the first impression people were going to get. I didn't, I didn't sprinkle a little bit around the entire club. I started on one end and kind of worked through the club. And the community rallied behind me because suddenly here's this guy that he's making a difference. He's making a change. I made an effort to get to know every member that came in my club. And I grew that membership base from about 400 memberships to 1200. I went from losing 200 grand a year to making about 250 grand a year. And I did that turnaround in about four years. So I got, I got the community to rally behind me. And that's, and, that, and that's what it's about. People love to hear the story about the guy that starts with nothing, He's going to work hard. He's going to deliver value rather than the, the story of the person that had everything given to him. And I think the people of that community appreciated how hard I was working for. Him. Did you make it a point to tell all of the community members what your whole mission was so that they could really understand why you were doing what you were doing? No, they, I mean, believe me, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know at the time that it was going to be, I mean, as I sit here today, that probably, that sounds like great advice, Ian, but I had hey, look. I was just trying to keep this ship afloat, you know, yeah. right? right? I was just trying to keep it real, keep it afloat, and just trying to generate some cash flow. So I made, more importantly with my staff, I made sure that they knew that there was, that we were going to change the way we did business, that we were not going to wake up and be average anymore, that we were going to be a team of overachievers. And anyone that wasn't on board, you're out. And, you know, there are, there were some people that, that I had to let go because they didn't share in the vision or the passion. And I think that's true in, in any company and any startup, it's very important. And I'll, or if you're acquiring a brand, make sure that people share in the same vision and don't keep your vision a secret. Say, look, th this is, this is, this is the expectation. And it's not my expectation. It's the expectation of the consumer. Because if you want to be relevant in today's world, it's not what you or I think, it's what our customer thinks that's going to matter at the end of the day. Right. So you, you have this, you, you, you jack up this brand, you're making 250K a year, great success. And then your brain's thinking, okay, next steps. At what point were you always thinking, you're like, oh, damn, you know what? If I did this once, I can do it again. Or did you have a conversation with someone? Like what sparked your interest to even want to build a second? Yeah. Well, you know what? I, w I was, I, I, I've always, you know, watching my father hard work and I knew, you know, I, I was chasing money and I'm a little embarrassed to say it. I really didn't cross that threshold until I was probably 50, right? That people say, wow, you know, why, why are you so driven? Well, I can tell you straight up and I'm just honest with everybody. I love the idea of making money and lots of it, right? So I was making money and there's, and there's some road rash in itself just within that mindset, right? Today, I live my life much differently but I worked very, very hard, very long and sacrificed a lot. So um, for me back then, it was like, look, I did this once, um, paying this thing off, that's one option. But the other option would be leverage the one club into another. And I did that seven times. So I, I, and I did it for 20 years and I sold that company. And when, it, when the dust had settled, I had about three and a half million dollars in the bank. Now keep in mind, I'm like, maybe what am I close to maybe 40 years old, right? I'm 40 years old. I have three and a half million dollars in the bank. And that is my life savings. That is it. That's what I had to show for myself. And, and it was get, stepping away from the fire a little bit and reflecting that I started thinking about, you know, what am I going to do next? Well, I tell you what, one of my former employees said, Hey, Peter, we don't like who you, who you sold the company to. Uh, would you ever consider building another club? This is the honest God truth. He says, would you ever consider building another club? I'll run it for you, but I just, you know, this is not going to work for me. And the guy was loyal as the day is long. He's the kind of guy that if a hand grenade came in the room, he'd dive on it for you. I mean, he was that loyal, right? And those are the kind of people I love. Right. So I, I felt compelled to help. 
So it got, it got my mind thinking about, you know what, what if I cut out the swimming pool? What if I cut out racquetball courts and aerobic studios and, and childcare? Pretty soon this club went from 40,000 square feet down to like 4,000 square feet. So all that was left was just the meat on the bone. We had trimmed all the fat. And, uh, and before I knew it, I said, look, you know what, instead of having 60 employees, I had two. And I had the ability to have it be 24 hours a day. I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eliminate contracts. So you're, start, you're talking about this new club that you're designing right here. And you're like, okay, how can we build a new club? And then you trim all the fat and you're basically bringing it down to its bare bones. And that was the initial idea? Yeah, just, just dumbing this thing down and then saying, look, how can I be something? I don't want to be another me too. What can I do? And I wasn't excited about spending millions of dollars of building a club. So pulling out the swimming pool, every time I would cut something out, I would say, am I still delivering value? Right. And, you know, I always talk about MVP, whether it's health clubs or software development, whatever, minimal valuable product. Right. So what's the minimum I can bring to the market and still deliver value? So I started, you know, cutting some of these things out. Well, cutting it down to what, what I just described, a 4,000 square foot box, that, that's what later became Snap Fitness. I built one club. I did it for a tenth of the, a t- literally a tenth of the cost. And I sold enough memberships, Ian, in 90 days to cash flow it for the year. I mean, think about that, 90 days. So I was... I did Question, want- I, I don't know that industry. So in industry standards, how does that compare to other well, it's, it's, it's crazy. Centers. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's a, I'm, I'm sure that there's others out there that have done that. But for me, I had never experienced that kind of success so quickly and so wow. easily. It was like falling out of bed, right? Because I was delivering a product that was $35 a month, no contract, because I didn't want to be another me too. I said, look, I'm going to make this really easy for the consumer. I, being 4,000 square feet, I was able to put it in neighborhood strip centers. So it was, I'd be right next to a Starbucks or a Subway or something like that. People drive past me on their way to work, on their way home from work. I was open 24 hours a day. I said, no contract. I'm going to deliver on my promise. In fact, I told, I told the members, hey, look, I'm going to give you a great product. But if I don't deliver on my promise, this is really easy. Just quit. I'm not right. Just quit. If I, and so I gave the people no reason not to join. Well, the reality of it is it was a very compelling product. And so I I built one in an urban market. I built one in a mid-sized market and I knew I had a tiger by the tail when I put one in in a in a town of 3,500 people, little Cocado, Minnesota. And uh, that, that the, the unit level economics were all the same that I sold enough memberships in 90 days to cash flow for the year. And that's when I knew that this product would work anywhere in any market. And from there, the rest is history. And that's did, you, did, you, did you have it pretty dialed in? You knew exactly how much it would cost to build towards all the economics? I had a, you know, you know what, Ian, I was really, that's one thing I am. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really neurotic about numbers and cash flow, right? So, and I think that you have to be if, you, if you're going to win. And so for me, um, the unit level economics made sense. And I said, look, this is very scalable. And you know what? The first year, I only did about 14 clubs the first year, right? When I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to franchise it. So I built the club. I franchised it. I did 14, 14 clubs the first year, which was an okay start. Wasn't where I wanted it to be, but I, but I knew that the dogs were eating the dog food, right? Well, the next year, I did about 60 clubs. And then after that, by the third year, I was, I was doing 150, 200 clubs a year. In fact, within, within, on the fifth year of my company, I opened 377 stores in one year. I was opening more than one store a day. Imagine that. So you talk about systems and processes and scale. It was tight. It was really tight. Bro, how does that even happen? That's crazy. Opening up one club a day. So you must have hired some amazing people that helped run the ship. You know what? Here's the reality. When I started, the same, the same systems I had for building five clubs a month was the same system I had for building a club a day. You just plug in more resources to do the same job. And you make sure that your staff stays in their lane. And that, that's the important part. Look, you know, you can't have people running around with their hair on fire. You stay in your lane. This is the, piece, this, this is the part of the game that you need to manage. And people understood it. 
And, you know, so my job was to make sure that people had the tools necessary to thrive. But the other part was to manage the people that keep everybody in their lane and out of each other's hair, right? What was the biggest curveball that you didn't see coming when you went from, say, 10 clubs to 100 clubs? You know, probably the biggest curveball was just the um, – the, the pace, the trajectory of how I was growing. I mean, that I didn't, you know, when I started, I didn't think, I mean, and people even ask me today, my gosh, Peter, did you ever think you'd have 6,000 locations in 28 countries spread across three brands? I mean, my honest, my honest answer, did I ever think I, I was going to have that kind of success? No, of course not. I'm not. You'd be crazy to say that, right? But I also say, I'm certainly capable of doing it. I knew I was capable of it, but I didn't know that I could deliver the product, the right product that was relevant at the right time to the right people and make it soar, right? So for that, that's what I'm, I'm so grateful about. My, my whole life is, is a narrative about, you know, overcoming adversity, learning from mistakes, and, and, uh, and being thankful for what I have. Yeah, it's interesting that you talked about knowing that you were capable Do you think that's something that you're just born with? Like you are just being raised, you just believe that you could achieve anything? Or is it a process of kind of learning that you are capable of it? I think, I think it's a little, little everything. I, I always say that, you know, fear, fear is a dream killer. Okay. I mean, and fear manifests itself between the six inches between your ears. Right. So uh, I always tell people, look, you, you have to have confidence in yourself. And I don't care if it's in business, on the football field, pick your sport. It doesn't matter, right? So I think years of playing racquetball where you're a one-man team on the court, you know what? You better look within. When you're in there getting your ass kicked, you're going to do one of two things. You're, gonna, you're either going to bear down or, or, you're, or, you, or you're just going to give up, right? So I think there's so many uh, similarities in, in sports, which is not – which doesn't shock me when so many people transition from athletics to business and they, and they do fairly well. And so for me, it was, it was just, uh, you know, just continue to learn from mistakes and trying not to repeat them. Yeah. Something that's always fascinates me is, is how people that run these empires have any sort of work-life balance. Cause there's so many entrepreneurs right now that are struggling. They're working 24 hours a day, and, you know, they're in that grind phase where they're getting their stuff going or they are successful, but they're still working all the time. They're making good money, but, you know, they don't have any life that they, they don't have time for their family. They're not doing the things they love. What yeah. have you kind of like, number one, what have you learned about work-life balance? And number two, what do you do today to be able to run this empire and still, you know, have time yeah. to do a podcast with Ian? Right on. <laughs> Well, you know what? And that's something that I learned along the way, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, up until, you know, last year, last January, I, I stepped down as the CEO, which at that point in my life was the, the, the day-to-day decisions of the company were no longer resting on my shoulders. Now, I'll tell you what, that's a surreal experience. And I talk about this often. When you're going into your own office and you're boxing up your own things of, an, of something that you've built for 35 years, right? It is a, it's surreal. It's like an auto body experience when you're putting it in the, in, in the back of your Escalade and you're wondering, what the hell am I doing, right? But it, it was good. And it literally took me a few months to kind of get my head around it about, look, what is, because it kind of felt like everybody was going to school and I was staying at home. But I eventually settled in. I eventually um, l- learn to appreciate what I had accomplished and then ask myself the question, you know, what do you want to do for the next 50 years? How do you want to live? Because I knew how I had spent the last 50, right? So it was really just trying to focus more on the balance. Make no mistake about it. The 35 years when I was in the fitness space and grinding it every day, there was a lot of sacrifice and a lot of road rash. You know, it, it was, you, you sacrifice a lot. And, and I don't have any regret. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me today, you know, what is your, what your one regret? It's kind of a silly question because you can't turn back time, right? You got to, you have to own everything. And, but the one thing that I do say is I wish I would have danced a little more. And what I mean that, I mean that figuratively that I wish that in the 35 years, I would have, I would have, you know, taken a breath a little bit more and, and traveled a little bit more and, 
and, and, and chilled out a little bit more. But I was so obsessed or afraid of failure that um, I just kept grinding, you know. I just kept thinking, it's kind of like the racquetball court. I would play, I would practice every day like a, like a madman, right? I, and, I love that your sport was racquetball. That's fantastic. Right? God, it's, it's funny, right? People, most people are like, hey, Peter, what is racquetball anyway? I'm like, yeah, right? It's, but in its day, it was, it was a hot sport. It was really, really fun. And it kept oh, you dude, it's so much fun. I mean, yeah. one of my favorite backyard sports of all time is badminton. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, it's, so it's, you know, it was a great sport and it served me well just to, to be, a, you know, to obviously keep me in shape and keep me sharp. Yeah. Staying in shape both mentally and physically. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know what, you, you have to do it. And I always say every day you should try to learn something every day, whether you're reading or, or watching a YouTube video, whatever it is, but every day, man, you got to get up with something, some level of purpose. And, and that, for me, when I think about balance in my life today, that's, that's really what I think about. I, you know, for me, I know giving back is important because I think about where I came from. And, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't grow up in Section 8 housing, so I don't want to paint that picture. Um, but I was, we, we were very middle class. And, and um, you know, I went to school in a two-room schoolhouse, right? So, I mean, my, my twin brother and my, and my next oldest brother, we were all in the same classroom. And my older one of my brothers and three sisters was across the hall, right? So, you know, I, it was where I came from. I quit college my junior year, right? And, and, uh, and it's kind of funny, Ian, because I had about $12,000 of student loan debts. <laughs> you, did, you did that way before it was cool to do so. <laughs> right. I, did, I just said, hey, look, I felt like I was digging a hole. I said, I felt like, my gosh, how am I ever going to pay back this $12,000? Because I, that's more money I'd ever seen in my life. And every year was another four grand getting thrown on top of it. And uh, you, you know what? I think everything happens for a reason. And, um, you know, I, one, one morning I just woke up. I was studying business statistics, having breakfast with my twin brother. And I remember looking at him saying, F it. I closed my book. I said, I quit. And he says, you know, what do you mean you quit? I said, I I've, I've had, I've had enough of this college. It's not, it's not, it's not doing, it's not going to do it for me. It's not what I want to do. I don't think it's going to help me. And I didn't know what my plan B was going to be, but I knew that it wasn't college and, and things just fell into place for me. I had, you know, opportunities and we never told our parents, my twin brother and I, he, he quit two minutes later, same guy quit two minutes later. And we lived, we stayed in the dorm rooms, lived there through spring semester. My parents never knew, which <laughs> is pretty, cool. It's funny. That's pretty, that's a savage move. <laughs> right. It's crazy. Education is shifting and it's shifting in such an exciting way. You know, before now than ever, you can learn anything, be anything, do anything. If you have internet access, most of the world does. Some of the world still doesn't. But just having that playing field, that even playing field is amazing. But there's so, so much knowledge so just wrapping it up in a way that's digestible at one time, I feel like is one of the biggest issues. It's so true. And you know what? It used, it used to be, oh, you need a college degree. You need a college degree. And that, that was what, what was always like a parrot blowing in my ear. You need a degree. And you need a degree. But the reality of it is, even in today, when you walk into a place, unless, unless you're specialized, unless you're an attorney, you have to pass the bar or a doctor or a dentist, something that requires some sort of certification. I tell you what, you, if you get a major in business, they're not, they don't ask you to show you your degree. They just say you have a, a college degree. You could fib your way all the way through it. There's, by having a degree, it does not ensure success. It does not ensure that you're going to, that you're going to win in a big way. It's in fact, for me, the three years that I spent in college, I loved the, the experience of life that I experienced, but there's, there's nothing that I went to college and learned that I apply today in my business life. It's really Business for me in, in the roles that I played in the last 30 years, it's all about being able to communicate and relate with people and getting and, and getting people to go to to go to battle with you. Right. It's there's no degree for that. Yeah, that's for sure. And when you I'm curious what gives you that rush today, that serotonin, that dopamine blitz. You know, you've been through the ups and downs of building businesses, which is typically the dream that most people are pursuing and yeah. you you came out the other end and you look healthy and it seems yeah. like you know i'm sure you have some scars on the way 
But yeah. what, what fills your cup these days? Like what makes you feel like when you go to bed, you just wake up feeling like an absolute champion because that day was, was crushed? Yeah, you know what? I, you know, f- first of all, the, the road rash that comes with success, every one of those I appreciated, right? And as long as, you're, as long as you acknowledge them, right? Don't, adversity is where character is built, right? And being able to acknowledge the adversity and fighting your way through it, that is all part of how you build character and how you become whoever you're going to be. Bar none. In fact, I, I don't know, Ian, I can't tell you one uber successful business person that has not experienced some level of adversity in a big way, multiple times along the way. So what fills my cup today? What truly does is serving. You know, I, I plan to spend the next 50 years of my life serving and, and when I mean that, I mean serving people, and whether it be, you, you know, some people think I'm a little crazy, and I probably am a little nuts, but I love to, I love to get on my bike and, and go into the hood of Miami with my backpack full of, like, cookies and bottled water, and I get right with the people. They have no idea. I got my, my, my beat-up jeans and a T-shirt on, and I'm, and I'm just pedaling through the hood, right? And I, and I roll up on people. I don't have my iPhone out. I just say, hey, what's going on? I said, are you, are you thirsty? How about who wants a cookie, right? Or who wants a cupcake? Whatever it is. And I sit down and, and I just get, I, I make friends, right? And it's not until I leave that I say, you know, let's just say the guy's name is Chuck. I, I'll say to him, hey, Chuck, are we friends? And he'll say, well, hell yeah, Peter, we're friends, right? And I say, you mind if I take a selfie of us? So I, I, I take my phone out, I put my arm around his shoulder and, and I'll take a picture and then I'll post, say hi to my new friend, Chuck, right? And all I'm trying to do is bring awareness to, to you know, the homeless issue that we have. But more importantly, you know, the hardest thing to give away in is your time. Giving away money is easy, but giving of your time, I'm telling you, brother, that is, that will wake you up in a hurry, right? So I love doing that. What I really love is when I, when I have an opportunity to mentor someone, whether it be a young aspiring entrepreneur or somebody who's making a career path, I love it when I have a chance to sit down with them and then they, 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 they post me back and say, dude, what you told me, it was life changing for me. And I, I, get the, I get the ride that horse every week, which is beautiful, that, that I get to say something to people that are willing to listen and they're willing to put into motion what you're suggesting. And I'm saying it because I tell them, hey, look, I would pivot a little bit if I were you because I've been where you are and this is what I did and it worked for me and I think it's going to work for you too, right? So when they, when, they, when they come back and say, that was life-changing for me and that, that to me, that lights my fire more than anything. Dude, that's so cool. It's cool that you're down to hang with the homeless and just chop it up and you can be a normal person and speak normally and see people as people. And then at the same time, you can hang out with Richard Branson and, and get down with the biz, you know, whatever it is. You seem like a people person. Yeah, and-, and Richard Branson, by the way, he's a cool cat, right? I mean, he's a cool, he is one cool dude. I had the opportunity to, to, to listen to him speak. And that's one thing I loved about him. You know, he'll drop an F-bomb. And, you know, he's just, he's just, he is who he is. He's a real, he's a real guy. He's a man's man. And, and he gives it to you straight. And, and you know, for me, though, that, that's, if I'm able to do that, I'm, I'm so appreciative. And, and I always say, look, money doesn't make the man. And, you know, I learned that from my father as well. And my father, he did, he did, he did okay for himself, right? He, he, he didn't make huge money, but he did, he, he did enough to feed the seven kids and, and, and live a good lifestyle. Um, but money doesn't make the man for one. And, and, you know, I always laugh about it now, but I say, if you ever walk into a restaurant and you see three guys in a suit and one guy in jeans and t-shirt and flip flops, he's the one with the money. So, <laughs> know what I mean? It's, it's just a, uh, you know, it just keep it real. That's what, that's what it's about today. Keep it real. Be humble, be kind, be loving, be thankful. Keep it real. Be humble, be kind, be loving, be thankful. That's the motto. All, all of it, right? All of it. Nobody wants, nobody wants condescending and nobody wants that. Nobody wants egomaniac. That's, that's just, that's so yesterday and so old and that's just not cool, right? Right. I mean, obviously, there's some people that have their own tribes, and their tribe might be that. Personally, I'm all in with what you're talking about. That seems right. like exactly how I try to live my life. You got it, and that's a great that's a great way to live. You wake up every day, and you're thinking, "Man, 
what a ride I had and my ride isn't over yet. So I just look at it and say, and that's another thing that I think is so amazing. I'll talk to guys that are in their seventies and they're talking about the next business deal they're going to do. You know what I mean? Which I love. They're like, fuck it. I'm not, I have retirement. What's that? I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm into the, my next thing. That's why I don't even like the word retirement. I think, I think that we should just call it transition. I'm transitioning into my next thing because retirement to me just sounds boring and sedentary. It does. That's, I've never, ever heard anybody say that. So yeah. thank you for just feeding that. I've never heard anyone just make that comparison. You're totally right. Transition right? is such a better way of explaining it. Yeah. No way. Yeah. It's just, God, who wants to retire? What a drag. I mean, obviously it's like, people get purpose by living life every day and you take away the goals they take away their purpose and they take away the feet that they stand on almost yeah no exactly right and that's and that's that's a great point that you make on you know you you got to dig deep and and do a lot of soul searching when you're when you are transitioning especially when you've accumulated some unbelievable wealth that that your identity is not your money right and i would say money does not define me in fact, I did a podcast just a few weeks ago and I said, look, you know what? I, I know that I'm always going to be able to make money because I, I have that ability. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of losing money. It, it, it doesn't define who I am. And, and um, you know, I, I live every day to its fullest. But you're all about that challenge, man. You're all about the challenge. And that's the biggest thing I take away. I got off our phone call. You love being challenged. Yeah, I like the, uh, can you tell the story of the, uh, the hotel that you, that you run? The, 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 you're talking about the, 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 uh, lecture, the camp I have in the Serengeti. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. yeah it's a, I mean, honestly, that was, I mean, that's been, a, that's been a ride. That's a ride that just keeps on going, which I love, <laughs> but a, a, a buddy of mine just, uh, he, he approached me about making a donation and, uh, and participating in this, at this time, a, a small lodge in the Serengeti. And uh, I didn't do any due diligence because I believed in him, right? So I said, well, if you're in, I'm in. Well, make a long story short, they, they came back about six months later. They did some improvements. They needed some real money. I turned back to my buddy and I said, look, you, you put in the, the money, I'll match it, right? So I wanted him to have as much skin in the game as I did, and he did. And it ended up being that the, the rest of the partners defaulted on the loan, and suddenly he and I are in the lodge business. And then we had to we had to pony up again because I said, look, if we're going to do this, let's not be average. Let's let's gut this place. Let's put in an infinity pool. Like, you know, we've got a great setting here. We can make we can make it amazing. Let's do it. Let's man up and do it. And and you know what? He believed in the same thing I did. So today it's it's a five star lodge just outside the Serengeti, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's, I it's, I didn't know where the Serengeti was, so I looked it up. So that's in northern Tanzania. Yeah, northeast. Yeah. So northeast. Why? Why there? I, well, hey, I didn't have a choice. I didn't. I didn't. I was just doing because my friend asked me, and it wasn't a lot of money. But, you know, for the, the initial investment, I thought it'd be kind of fun. Um, you know, I wasn't betting the farm. It was just a little passive little investment I was going to have. Hell, I didn't know I was going to have seven figures into it. Uh, you know, five years later, and 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 literally own half of it now. So my buddy and I own it, but it's great because here we sit today. Our business was up 300% uh, last year versus the year before. So it's, you know, it's, it's do it's, it's, it's a good business and it's, it's a lot of fun and it's, it sits on 30,000 acres in this little concession area. It's just absolutely beautiful. And when I go there, if, if I ever brought you there, Ian, you could, you could hang there for a month. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's so, it's such a surreal experience and, uh, and, and seeing nature in its raw state. I mean, literally, it's, un, it's hard to imagine, but when I, when I pull up on lions and they're 10 feet from my rig, right? They don't run. They don't know. Do you know a male lion knows no fear? I mean, can you imagine living a life with no fear, right? I literally pull right up on them. They, they don't, they could care less about me. I'm not a part of their food chain. And I can sit there and watch them eat eat a warthog or whatever it is they're eating. It's pretty. It's pretty damn amazing. Man, I'm obsessed with lions. This is my right. Favorite. See that lion painting over there? Yeah, right on. I love that. Yeah, it's my favorite painting. That's really cool. That's Dude. a cool picture. Yeah, I, I it, we had this one girl on our show, Lisa Kitasaho. She has a super interesting story. At 19 years old, she went to 
a uh, cheetah orphanage to volunteer for a week. Wow. Found, found her calling. And then at the Western Cape Cheetah Conservation, she ends up getting a job. And she has since lived there for the past six years, raising and rehabilitating cheetahs. That is so cool. And it's yeah. like her day to day, you know, when I think about it, you know, she probably doesn't make as much money as say some business mo- like mogul in New York City. But I'll tell you, her day to day seems so much cooler and more fulfilling than ninety nine point nine percent of the stuff I do. You know For what real. I mean? Yeah, and it's no, just so real. exciting when you meet people that are just grabbing life and being yeah. present. Because I feel like I'm not present enough. I need to achieve that more. But it's tough in this society, you know. Yeah, no, that's a. I, I admire people like that too. I've got some friends that are like that. They they feel, you know, they never really settle into a job. They kind of go from one to the other. They're always going on these cool trips and, you know, living life to their fullest. And I, I look at that and sometimes I think, man, talk about some life stories, right? Some some great memories they've created. Well, I'm back here just grinding it every day, right? So it's you know, people take different paths for different reasons, but. Obviously, as I sit here today, you know, my narrative is, you know, for the next 50 years of my life, I am, I am going to enjoy my life helping people. I am going to travel and make a difference wherever I can. I know that I know that that is my calling because I feel like God has blessed me so much that he's got a plan. He has a plan for me. He has to because nobody wins like I win without a plan of something. So, you know, and when, you know, every every morning. I, I, I start my day in the word a, a bit. I don't know how much you, you follow me. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the type of Christian that sits on, a, sits on a milk carton with a blowhorn in one hand and a Bible in the other. But I do this. I, I do. I am well aware that I've been blessed. I'm well aware that, you know, with many things that are given, much is expected. I own that. So, you know, the next 50 years, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's not about making money. It's about giving back. And there's nothing brings me more joy when I can, when I can help somebody get pointed in the right direction and they actually, and they actually win and, and, and thrive and kick ass. I love that. Yeah. And doing it with people too, right? Like you can right. have, you can have all the fancy stuff, but if you're doing it alone, what's the purpose, you know? No, that's right. I mean, I laugh about that now I'm single. I've been divorced for five years, so I'm single. Right. And, and I'm, and people say, wow, I mean, I did a podcast, geez, maybe a year ago. And I said, I've never been lonelier than I am right now. My gosh, that was one of the worst words that could have ever come out of my mouth because people think, oh, I mean, they think I'm going to jump off my building or something. Look, I'm not like, it's not that bad. I promise you. But you're exactly right, Ian. You know what? I, I want someone that I can, that I can experience life with. You know, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to be a serial dater. That's not my jam. Right. So, you know, I'm patiently waiting for her to come along, but it's a, uh, but you know, having stuff with no one to share it with is, that's a bullshit life. No, thanks. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, just good. And friends can obviously fill in for that. You know, you don't need a, you don't need a partner. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. I'm looking, I'm, you know, for me though, it's, I'm, I'm patient. I thought I found her up until about five months ago and that didn't work out. And so that's just another, another life lesson along the way. Right. Yeah. One of my good friends, he was ta- telling me just yesterday, he's like, Ian, I'm 25 years old, super successful kid. I call him my, my boy genius friend. Right. He's like, I'm 25 years old, but honestly, I feel like I have the brain of like a 45 year old when it comes to dating. It's like, yeah. I just, I just don't want to date. I don't want to do any of that. The next person I date, like I want to like freaking marry, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to waste my time. Like, I just want to go all in on yeah. that, you know? And it's just no. interesting, like how the brain turns, right? You know, I used to, you know, dating used to be super, super exciting to me. It's not as exciting. It's still as exciting. You know, I'm 27. Yeah. Life's, life's dope. But yeah. you know, it's just not as sweet because, you know, you're spending half your day. You're spending all this time. Obviously, you'd like to have the perfect person come into your life, but it comes, right? You just got to keep doing what you're doing and being passionate at the things you're passionate about and assuming that you're doing what you love. You're going to attract something that is a not something someone that is doing something similar well i keep looking for but i and i tell you what it's a it is really interesting the and the more you have you know the bigger the target is on your back and so you become a little bit you become a little bit standoffish a little bit paranoid well you just you, you gotta wonder if they're if they're if they're really if they're really into you or they're into the lifestyle right so you know i've i've tried you know, a number of different, 
services of, of not like match, but more, more professional services where they, um, they do a lot of screening to try to, you know, it just kind of, it takes the first three or four steps out of the phase. Right. But at the end of the day, I, you know, you want to be able to find somebody that is just real and, and raw and not entitled and obviously beautiful and all those things that, that you have on your chest. Yeah. So I keep, you know, I, I'm patient. She's, she's going to come one of these days. Maybe next time we do the podcast, I'll, I'll, I'll have her sitting next to me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. For me, my goal is I'm just going to get a bunch of animals. That's like in my little compound, I'm just going to have I love it. like an orphaned ocelot or some exotic <laughs> animals. And I'm just going to be like that dude with like the 12 cats. Yeah. Right? I'm going to be, I'm going to have a big ass smile on my face. Like what up? <laughs> that's, so, that's so Peter, awesome. let's just circle back a little bit and let's kind of go towards this kind of dynamite question that kind of requires a little bit of self-reflection. If you could have went back to that that version of you in college that was right on the cusp of jumping into entrepreneurship, leaving college, making this big move. And you could have talked to him today and you had five minutes or whatever, and you could have told him one, two or three things that could have saved you a ton of time, money, headache, heartache, all those things. And obviously just for the sake of, of the question, it can't be, I wouldn't have told myself anything because it made me who I am today, even though it is a great answer. Yeah. But, you know, what are some things that you might have told yourself that could have provided you a ton of value? Well, and you know what, <clears throat> you're, you're exactly right, Ian. You know what, you don't, you don't get a do-over, right? So you, you kind of take it as it comes. So what I, would, what I would tell that person today is, look, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And there's going to be some days where you're going to feel like you're, like it's over, right? And, and, uh, and, and I, I've had, I'll, I'll share one of those stories as, as well with you in a minute, but I would just say, look, it's, it's not going to be easy, but, and, but stay focused and, and, you know, follow your dream and you, you have to be, it's, it, you have to be tenacious. You can't quit. You know, if you believe in something like for me, that dream of, of, of trying to turn around that health club, that's when I did that, I knew that I had the qualities necessary to relate with people and to build a business. Fortunately for me, I stayed in that lane for 35 years. I didn't go off and try to be something else. Now, did I, did I venture into some other um, 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 minority stake investments along the way? Well, of course I did. But my core business was the health and wellness space. I never deviated from it. And so, and, and I, I'm thankful for that. So, you know, I would tell myself, good, you know, good job for staying in the, in your lane and just understand it's, it's, it's going to be a hell of a lot of work. And some days are, some days you're going to be a cruise director and other days you're going to be a firefighter. So get, get your head around that. A cruise director and firefighter. I like how they say the CEO is a glorified janitor because he's always just cleaning up messes or yeah, putting out yeah. fires. It's true. You know, some days, some days you're again, and everybody's doing their job and things are just falling in place and, and, and it, it's, and you make it look really easy. And then there's other days that are just character building one character building moment after another. And you're like, man, alive, this thing is coming apart at the seams. Yeah, you know, and that's just, the, that, those are all life experiences. I don't care if it's at your job or at your home. Right. You just got to kind of muscle your way through it and, and keep your common sense about you. Don't panic. You just you mentioned right before this uh, on your first tip that you were going to sh- you had a story you wanted to share. Yeah, you, I was I remember the, the, the very that the very first club where I had that opportunity to turn around that failing club. And I remember is about three in the morning. I, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I went upstairs at the time I was living with my parents because I, I didn't have any money. I was making 16 grand a year. and uh, and. I had payroll that was going out and I had no money in the checkbook. I had literally a few hundred dollars. I had 45 employees. Uh, and I was sitting upstairs in my kitchen, in the, my parents' kitchen. I was crying, literally tears coming down my face, three in the morning. I'm like, I am, this is the end. So the, this, this is what the end feels like. And I don't know how my mother heard me, but she, you know, I, I feel her hand on the back of my neck and, and she just says, she just said, Peter, you will fight your way through it. That's all she said. And then she went back to bed, right? And I'll be damned if the next day, you know, three or four people didn't come in and prepay their membership for the year, which allowed me to cover the net. I mean, I, I was certainly not going to cash my payroll check. I would be the last to cash my check. But 
I got through it, but that moment, and that's why today when I, when I listen to some people speak and they've never, they've never actually ran a business, they've never had, have to had those moments of, my gosh, this is the end. All they want to talk about is business theory, but they don't have any practical hands-on experience through it. I don't, I think until you have that, you know, those road rash stories that you're not, you're not qualified to, to talk about, you know, what, what real life feels like as an entrepreneur. Cause it's, I tell you what, there are some days it completely sucks ass and other days it's fantastic. Yeah. But I guess the whole crazy you know, irony and all that is that the bad days are what actually create the good days and not just yeah. because of the fact that, you know, t- yesterday sucked, today's great, great, but you just have no perspective if you don't have bad days. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're so right. You know what? In times of adversity, that's where all the growth takes place. hundred percent. Right. I mean, until you are pressed into a corner and you have to think, you have to think outside the box, which is a good place to be. Um, and, and, you know, adversity is where that growth takes place because you've got you've to lean forward into what are you going to do with this business? What is not working, right? When, when you wake up every day and you think that you've got it all figured out when you're in business and, and you're no longer evolving, you're, you're going to wake up in a few months, six months, and you're just no longer going to be relevant, You've got to continue to lean forward in everything you do. It's so important. That's so important that you just said that because no matter, it seems pretty crazy how, no matter how bad you F up and you see this in the news all the time, some crazy shit happens. No matter how bad the world gets, people tend to not care six months from now. Right. Right. It's exactly right. So, and, and I, there's this line that I love. The only way to coast is downhill. So the second you get complacent and you start coasting, the whole organization starts coasting. Exactly. And and the only way to learn that is by building because it's a natural habit to coast. I mean, not on your level, but you know, I had some pretty awesome success at 21 years old. I hit a big rank in my company that I wanted to hit so bad. I was hitting a six figure income and I legit just stopped. I stopped working and I thought I made it, you know, I I was like, let's go. Yeah. And then that serve you. It just, everything went downhill, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, like what's going on? Like, I don't deserve this. This is crazy. Right. I can't imagine 21 making six figures. You had to be, you had to be the guy for sure. With your posse of friends, you had to be the guy. It was dope. Life yeah. was sweet. And everybody that went through that experience, it's with Vima. Vima, we, I actually had the CEO of the company on our, on the podcast. Vima got shut down as an alleged pyramid scheme by the FTC. No way. It was an insane case. And uh, it's easily the greatest podcast, top five greatest podcasts anyone will ever listen to. And I say that because that's what everyone tells me. Yeah. It's easily our biggest one. But basically, the Vima is the first company in the history of the FTC imposing that level of TRO action, temporary restraining order, that was survived and was still in business afterwards. So it's, you know, they, in, in many ways they did win. And, uh, but the story of BK Bareko telling him, you know, how, you know, he, he considered suicide at points, you know, it was so bad that media painted him like Bernie Madoff, like he was this terrible yeah. person. And, and then in the end he got like a slap on the back because what he did wasn't really that bad. And so many other people were doing it, but right. obviously that's subjective. And yes, I yeah. am a hundred percent biased. Yeah. But uh, it's just a crazy story of business and people going through the gauntlet and coming out the other side, you know? I love it. I, I gotta, you know, after this cast, I'd love to see what episode that is. I'd love to listen to it. Dude, it would be, I would love to, for you to hear it and then, and then circle back. But yeah. here, what other thing I'm curious about is for the listeners right now that are right on the cusp, you know, maybe they're that 22 year old with the mullet and they're getting involved in their first opportunity and they're right on the cusp of jumping into entrepreneurship for the first time. What would you tell that person? I would say first, first and foremost, make sure that your plan is well thought out. And this is something that I come across a lot, especially with young entrepreneurs. And when I say well thought out, you know, what you have to ask yourself, the relevance of whatever it is you're trying to create, whether it's a product or a service, the relevance of it, what void are you, are you filling or are you enhancing an existing product? That's number one. Uh, number two, how much capital is it going to require? 
most of the time when I'm talking to people, they're completely undercapitalized. And number three, what is your exit strategy? And I can I am amazed at the amount of people that, that don't ask their question. Don't, don't, don't say, look, what's the exit strategy? Because in many cases, if it's a sales position or you're selling something and you're the, and you're the sales arm and you leave the company and now the sales dry up, that, look, that's not a sellable business. So really thinking those things through. And when you have a well thought out plan, then really the only thing left to do is execute. It's all about execution, right? So for people, and, that, and that's where I help them a lot, is just making sure that they're in a position where they can at least, if things work the way they want them to, that they have a high probability of success. It's, it's hard to fix. Some of the mistakes you make early on in a company, you can never recover from. So you've you got to make sure that you go into it with your eyes open and with a full-fledged plan of execution. Amen. Yeah. Peter, you're, you're a wealth of knowledge. I wish I could steal you all day, all freaking <laughs> Saying your time is just very valuable. I think that a lot of the stuff you shared is so applicable to our audience. And I know speaking for the listeners of the show, we definitely appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate it. And, and uh, I love, as I said, when you talk about young entrepreneurs, young, old, and, and I also want to say, for some reason, I, about 90% of the people I talk to are males. They're, 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 they're young men or, or, or men. And I, success is not gender specific and being an entrepreneur is not gender specific. So all of your female listeners out there, look, understand, I, I pull just as hard for the, for the women as I do for the men, right? And hard work looks the same, whether you're a man or a woman, right? Success look and feels the same, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, failure feels the same, whether you're a man or a woman, right? So I just say, look, everybody's going to fight the same battle. It's not gender specific. So, you know, just for all your female listeners, feel free to, 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 to hit me up if you want some direction. I, I make myself available because that's my purpose here for the next 50 years. Amen, brother. Hey, how can people follow you if they want to get more Peter in their life? I know you're always, you're always posting really good content on your stories. Your Instagram yeah. is always inspirational. Yeah. How thanks. Can people follow. So it's, you know, you'll know why I'm not the creative marketing director. My Instagram handle is Peter underscore Taunton, my last name. So there's not a creative lick in that. So it's just Peter underscore Taunton, T-A-U-N-T-O-N. Just follow me. And then, you know what? Message me. That's the best way. Message me right through Insta. And, and I'll, I'll respond back to you, right? I'm at a point in my life where I, I take the time to respond back. And when people say, hey, Peter, would you mind giving me 15 minutes? I, I'll do it, right? And because I feel, I wish that I had had that when I was 21, 22. Um, so, I, I, you know, I answer my phone when people call and, and I help people where I can. Amen, man. Well, hey, we appreciate your time as always. It's a damn good day to have a damn good day. Until next time. I love that shirt. I love there, it. There it is. I'll be sending one soon. So okay. I can't wait to see you. Uh, <laughs> right. my, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Ian. Thank